Uh, it is a pleasure to have uh, with us today Ivan Minchev. Uh, the, as you see also on the screen, uh, he's from the Leibniz Institute for Astrophysics in Potsdam in Germany. Uh, people working in galactic dynamics uh, know at least the name. So Ivan is an expert in embodied simulations uh, on galactic dynamics uh, and uh, especially he has worked a lot about uh, modeling the Milky Way galaxy and uh, has done a lot of work for uh, the radial migration of star and all that stuff. Uh, his PhD was in Rochester, New York with uh, Alice Quillen, which of course you know also the name. And then he started a series of uh, postdoc positions starting from Strasbourg, where we met, I think, for the first time, Ivan, many years ago. And now he's uh, in Leibniz, as you, as you see. So today he will speak about uh, a very interesting topic, whether uh, the Milky Way is in equilibrium. And so I think that at the end, we will have uh, the opportunity for questions. So. Ivan, you may start uh, sharing uh, the screen with your PowerPoint presentation. Yep. And at the end, you will uh, receive some questions. So let me uh, share it. Thank you for the introduction. Let's see. Actually, we should have tried, I guess, to share. So... OK, very nice. Can you see? Yes, yes. Very nice. So, so it's full screen and everything is okay. Full screen, etc. So okay, we start. All right. Okay, so uh, I thank Panos for the this invitation. Very excited to be in Athens, even though it's virtually. Uh, temperature is much better there than here, I suppose. And uh, a lot of this, the work that I'm doing, like the basics comes, of course, from Greece with the work by Contopoulos already many years ago. There's the basis of uh, all the galactic dynamics work and, of course, uh, Panos's work and Dia Tanasua and many others, I suppose. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about most of the Milky Way here, how to model the Milky Way disk. So galactic disk with a capital G is the Milky Way. And of course, using the best possible data, which is the Gaia data that has currently revolutionized the field in many different ways and more is expected to happen in the near future, in fact. So let's first start uh, very basic here with overview of our galaxy, what the components of our galaxy, um, which is similar to other disk galaxies. This is an edge on view. This cartoon is stolen from a talk by Ken Freeman. So we have a thin disk of stars that uh, most angular momentum is in those. They rotate um, around the galactic center. Then you have a thicker disk component, which is which uh, results from stars oscillating up and down. Can you see my mouse, by the way? Uh, the cursor, yes, we can the cursor, see. Cursor, yeah. So yeah, so the um, this uh, thick disk is present in many galaxies and important for understanding the formation of the galaxy, then you have a bulge component, this yellow thing. This could have um, be um, uh, a classical bulge is a radial orbits that are going through the center of the, uh, of the galaxy or, or end could be also the peanut due to the bar that has lifted orbits vertically uh, when it buckled and they were moving some figure eight orbits. Then you have uh, the uh, the stellar halo indicated by this yellow uh, oval here, which could also have some some rotation because of exchange with bar resonances work by Atanasula. <laughs> and of course, most of the mass is in the dark matter halo, which is about 200 times extending further than shown in this cartoon. Uh, the age of the galaxy is almost as the, the age of the universe based on the age of the stars, 13.5 billion years old. The disk across is 30, maybe even 40 kiloparsecs. So the radio here is 15, 20, the radius. And the solar radius is right there, somewhere in the middle, the mid plane, and mid radius um, around 8 kiloparsecs. These dots here indicate, I suppose, globular clusters that will go around. 
And of course, in, in addition, excuse me, excuse me, uh, uh, Ivan, uh, we can see the cursor, but uh, the slide is the very same, the, the very first slide. We haven't seen any other. Okay, really? now, okay, now uh, change, change your, okay, now we haven't seen this either. Okay, now, now we see the transparencies. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, because so now yeah, you see my cartoon that I was describing. Okay, yeah? yeah, yeah, exactly. So okay, go on. But uh, let's see. Hold on. Do you see? Do you see a change now? Yeah. Now we see the cartoon. So you saw the sun just coming in. No, not yet. No. So, try no. so I think when I'm in a full but, mode, it doesn't work actually. But uh, I try to change one more to, to see that. Yeah, I change see. now. Do you see anything? No. No. Ah. You see the cartoon again. So it stays frozen once I. Once I put in full screen, it stays frozen. Okay, now, okay, I see. That's weird. So, okay, let's try again. This is uh, this is the first slide. The first one. Do you then see try the second one? No. If he stops, if you stop share and you try it again, it might work. I can stop try that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, stop sharing. And try it again. Hold on, maybe I can share my entire screen yes. uh, instead of the whole desktop. Should I do that? Yeah. Yes. The whole thing, yes. Okay. Instead of just, uh, you can uh, see now? We see the second one. Okay, I put in full mode, you see full mode? Yes. And do you see the next slide? Now we see the cartoon. Oh, excellent. Okay. okay. I'm sorry about that. All right, so just quickly again, to show you that the thin disk, the thin disk is, uh, uh, is this here, the thick disk starts with the uh, high vertical um, uh, excursions here. So they hot vertically, we say, they kinematically hot. This is the bulge, which could be classical or due to the bar. And we have here the stellar halo. We have the, uh, the, the this is the stellar halo. Then we have the dark matter halo, which is much, much larger. And most of the mass is there, 95% or so. 10 to the 12 solar masses around the age of the universe, almost um, the thing is uh, that the galaxy is as old as almost the, the universe and the solar radius right here. But, yeah. Okay. Two thirds of all these galaxies have central bars. I'll give you an example. Here is one with a very strong prominent bar. This structure here is uh, the central bar that we also have in the Milky Way. And the spiral arms emanate from the ends of the bar, but that is uh, typically uh, an, an illusion because they are not necessarily connected or they connect and disconnect since the bar would rotate faster. And very quickly it will snap from this arm and connect to the other arm. But most of the time when you look in the sky, they're connected. This is an example of a non-barred galaxy with a very strong prominent bulge with stars on radial orbits, like a small halo in the center of the galaxy. And then you uh, have spiral arms starting there. But what does a galaxy look like? It's very hard to determine. This is a cartoon. Um, it's uh, <clears throat> our best understanding of what the location of the bar is. So this is the sun right here. Uh, the bar is oriented about 30 degrees ahead of us rotating. And then uh, because of the tracers, we know where the arms should be. And then we extrapolate, of course, we don't see on this side of the galaxy. I think that's what things should look like. But of course, due to our position in the disk, the morphology is still largely unknown. What we do see, galactic longitude and latitude, this is two mass image. This is what we see embedded in the disk. This is the outer disk on the sides, and this is the center. And you have the X shape here, uh, that uh, is caused by the, the bar peanut. You can see that here there is a larger, uh, this X shape is larger than on this side, which tells you that the bar is closer here. So it's essentially this part of the bar and the other one is farther away. Uh, but in order to find out the morphology of the disk, you need very good distances to the stars and you have to penetrate to these dust lanes. So it's quite complicated. You need to care about extinction. You need, this is an infrared. So the best would be done in the infrared. Uh, so in the old days, we have tried to do this very locally that I'll talk in a second. So what governs the evolution, the dynamical evolution of the disk is the resonance is due to uh, bar and spiral structure. And then, of course, we have the external perturbations. 
but what you uh, care about here would be uh, resonance is associated with the discs. So what is a resonance? If you have the monkey pushing on the pendulum at exactly the right time, monkey gets kicked out. Um, the bar, this is just to illustrate that the bar pattern speed is such that it overtakes the sun. And because it's a central component, it rotates fast. The spiral structure, on the other hand, most likely will lag the sun. And correspondingly, the, the, the uh, resonances will be shifted out. So the corrotation of the bar is just outside the bar. This is where the bar and the, and the background stars rotate together. There's only one place in the galaxy because the disk rotates differentially. So stars rotate faster here than here. And the, the bar and spirals would rotate as rigid bodies. The density waves, they, they rotate as rigid bodies. So there's only one position where they will rotate with the disk. The corrotation when a slower perturber is present is further out in the disk. In addition, the two strongest resonances are the inner and outer limbed resonances. Uh, the inner resonance of the bar is inside the bar, the outer is near the sun, we believe, or nowadays people believe it's outside the sun. I've we'll discussed that quite extensively in a bit. So most interestingly, um, things happen uh, to the dynamics because you always have multiple perturbers. You never have just a bar or just spiral structure. Even if, when you don't have a bar, you will have multiple uh, spiral patterns that move with different pattern speeds. So here I've illustrated just the bar and the spiral. You see how the resonances will overlap due to the spiral, due to the bar, and that creates very interesting phenomena uh, that I will describe later. <clears throat> Uh, just quickly here, how do you identify your uh, resonance radii? Uh, the pattern speed, the angular velocity of the spiral, uh, is equated here to the background star's uh, angular velocity, plus minus the epicyclic frequency, the radio epicyclic frequency. This is telling how stars move around their guiding radius and divided by the multiplicity of the pattern. Multiplicity of the pattern for the bar will be two, and for two arm spiral structure, also two for four arm spiral structure, M is four. And this way, whenever this is satisfied, you will have uh, plus and minus the outer and inner limit resonance. As I said before, when they rotate the same way, the two uh, angular velocities are the same. That's your corrotation. Uh, yeah, so these are the inner and outer limit resonances that you can identify in the galaxies. Now to see what happens around these, uh, you, it, it's easier if you have uh, something controlled like test particle simulations and here distribute a thousand stars uniformly in a circle. Uh, this is near the outer limit resonance for a four arm structure. And this is near the corrotation a thousand stars. So originally in a perfect circle, and then we let go flat rotation curve and just perturbation from the spiral and you have these beautiful squares forming and pulsations. And here you have these horseshoe orbits, but they never cross on the other side. Okay, these are the bifurcation points that are not crossed. But when you combine both, as I said, there are multiple patterns going together. So two spiral arms on top of each other. We are a combination of corrotation and outer limit resonance. First, here these horseshoe orbits are trying to form. But then you can see this irregular behavior, they're crossing around and a couple of representative stars to show that they actually can move around. And there is a net migration inwards. You see that everything shifted inwards here. Mostly everything shifted outwards when you're on one side of the uh, corrotation, the, the combination of resonance on the other side. So this is how radio migration happens when you have time dependent perturbations, you have this switching at that particular location and that's taken uh, those stars can be taken from another resonance and move uh, inwards in the disk or further out can reach uh, high distances uh, here is a more realistic simulation in the cosmological context done by marie martig we identified this particular one as a good model for the milky way and we've written tens of papers including a quite successful chemical evolution model that we produced. Uh, so we'll start here, the gases on the left, stars on the right, initially absolutely no stars here, everything is forming from scratch. A lot of mergers initially, gaseous disk 
here is more extended as you would expect. Last massive merger just went through. Now it's gonna come back. The disc was initially very thick uh, in the gas, so stars were forming already thick and now it's getting thinner as it extends. The bar is forming. <clears throat> And you see these uh, many arms here going around. If you do a Fourier decomposition, you will see that there are many different uh, multiple spiral sets. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is a simulation that I'll show some results from 13.567. Okay, here we go. And in the end, of course, you have some, uh, the whole time you have perturbations from satellites but uh, not so massive after uh, the last one, like seven, eight years ago. Just to motivate the need for numerical simulations after this introduction, um, it's clear that this complex dynamics, the multiple perturbers that are not steady either, they also evolve with time and have external perturbations that come and go, uh, requires the, uh, the use of n-body simulations, and that will be best if you do it in cosmological context. The disks are growing. Um, the questions that we would like to answer are what are the spiral structure parameters? How many spiral arms? How they rotate? How strong they are? What are the bar parameters? Is the bar short or long, fast or slow? What is the bulge structure? Uh, there are big debates whether it's just a, a, it's a classical, whether it's just the bar bulge, um, orbits lifted by the bar, or there's also a classical bulge component, which will have a different history. And uh, what is the disk structure as a function of radius and distance from the plane? Do we have uh, wiggles in the disk, or is the disk uh, vertically uh, symmetric? Now, these questions actually describe the current disk state, which is... Uh, well, now it's becoming more and more known, but it's been largely unknown, as I said, for obvious reasons. And once uh, we go to these questions, how did the Milky Way thick disk form? How did the Bojan bar form? And how much radial migration happened in the disk? For this, we require some kind of a formation model. So numerical simulations are really important uh, to capture all the phenomena uh, together. Uh, and to draw conclusions about the history of the galaxy. That, that's the main point, to understand how galaxy formed and evolved. Our galaxy is the, the best one that we can observe of all of these galaxies. So it will be a very good representative uh, species that we can compare to external galaxies. <clears throat> so start here before Gaia, the best, what was the best data set? That was the Hipparchos data from the Hipparchos satellite. And that was located very close to the sun here, about 100 parsecs from the sun, this yellow dot indicates. We, of course, cannot look at the morphology from that, but we can draw conclusions based on the velocity space that these uh, stars are here have. So this is the very well-known UV plane. U is the radial velocity, positive in the direction of galactic center for some reason. And V is the tangential velocity, stars, how stars go around the galactic center. So when you make this plot, and uh, you see structure here. That means that there's something that causes these clumps. These are called moving groups. And they are of various ages and chemical composition. Therefore, they are not dissolving clusters. Um, Coma Berenices, Sirius, Pleiades, Hyades, and Hercules studied to death. Hercules, the uh, fastest moving one at minus 50, lagging the galactic cent the, the, uh, sorry, the, the local standard rest. Zero, zero would correspond to a perfectly circular orbit at the solar radius. So this tells you that this is a, a, yeah, 50 kilometers per second behind that. A lot of work done on this. And uh, there, uh, many of these streams have been associated with uh, the bar or spiral structure. We can constrain the parameters. I'll show you how. In the case of the bar, but it's similar for the spiral, you have, for example, the outer limit resonance of its position just inside the sun. There are two types of orbits. One is against the bar orientation. The other one is supporting the bar. So if you're close to those two and stars move around, they will go through the solar neighborhood and they will produce in the UV plane <clears throat> such moving groups, streams. Now, this is a simulation showing different positions in the disk 
like this. So this is the Gaia data. And those are the nine volumes. You expect if it's caused by spiral spiral structure, there will be a certain shifts in these clumps with uh, galactic radius or moving from here to here, or with the galactic angle moving from here to there. So what you expect to see then is uh, when you move galactic radius, you would expect uh, to see, so this blue line here, to see a shift in the tangential velocity downwards. And when you move the angle, you will see a shift in the radial velocity, or positive. And this has really not been done properly with Gaia, mostly because, yeah, you see, you start losing some clumps. So things are not as simple as we thought when you go away from the solar neighborhood, from the immediate solar neighborhood here, uh, there is no such regular structure. So that tells you that uh, this is, these simulations are always done with a single perturber. So when you have multiples, then things become more complicated. Now we'll moving on now to a more recent uh, debate here, the Milky Way uh, bar that we were very happy to be uh, about three and a half kiloparsecs and quite fast, 50, 60 kilometers per second. For many years, people explained the Hercules stream with that and some other clumps as well. But since 2015, uh, some data of directly observing the bar have sh shown that the bar is actually quite longer and quite slower, right? We go from 50, 60, 35, 45. And just an illustration here, if this is the sun, this will be your fast, what we thought fast and short bar. This is slow and long bar. So a significant difference, yeah? Yeah, probably I will not go through all of them, but the major example here from since Danon was the Hercules stream being explained by the bar and constraining the... So the angle, we still agree on the angle with respect to the uh, galactic center sun line. Um, so so it's matching the this uh, short and fast bar longitude velocity diagrams can explain low velocity moving groups in addition to Hercules and variation of work constancy with velocity dispersion, among other things. But a lot of a lot of work here that everybody agreed on this bar. Now all of a sudden, um, this was suggested in 2015. Actually, we should jump down here. Vega et al. 2015 using a compilation of data. Uh, show that the bar matching to an n-body model is uh, longer and slower. And all of a sudden, we explained it with Hercules. Hercules could be explained now by the corotation of the bar. Okay, we didn't see that before. Um, we measure, so the when you measure directly <clears throat> with the Tremaine-Weiberg method, the bar from the flow of uh, stars using the continuity equation, you would measure a pattern speed uh, a much slower pattern speed. So that agreed with the results of the n-body simulation by Vegetal. So, I mean, there is no doubt that uh, it seems like the bar appears to be, to be slow moving, but that's the instantaneous. So maybe there are some fluctuations there. And there are some ridges in the RV5 plane that can be explained also by this long and slow bar. So the first indication, as I said, uh, coming from Vegetal 2015, these are the data that they use. This tells you the bar end is closer to us on this side, galaxy rotating this way. Compilation of VVV, you kids and two mass data. And this is the end body model doing different slices above the plane. But the, uh, the plot that actually showed that this is really working is this. This is the data of B slices in a galactic latitude. Here the B is changing. And this is a different way of subtracting something. This is essentially the same thing. And the bottom two panels, the bottom two rows are the end body model, which amazingly looks very similar to what we have about, right? So it's very convincing that yes, the bar appears to be so long, but again, the end body simulation <clears throat> was a frozen state. So it was not looking at the dynamics, uh, how it evolves with time. And then it was done also with M2M model, which is also not dynamically evolving. So we thought uh, to look at we thought to look at this in more details using two simulations in the cosmological context, one by 
Tobias Buck that was uh, used for studying the Milky Way uh, bar. So it's similar, um, the Milky Way and um, the, the central bar here has very many similarities with the Milky Way. And the other way, okay, so here the spiral arms look quite flocculent, not very strong. The other example is the one I talked about. This is the same simulation I showed the movie of uh, Marie, by Marie Martig. So here the bar is a similar size, but the spiral arms are stronger. So the, we call this model one, model two. I'll just talk about model two and show how we do the measurements of the bar, bar length. Here we did it at three, uh, three different times, separated by about one galactic one disk uh, rot rotation at the solar radius, about 200 million years separated. So first actually is this one, then this one, then that. So the bar is, appears to be short. Here there are three ways of measuring it. And in all three ways, uh, the bar appears to be quite short in the first one, then significantly uh, longer here and even longer there. Oops. These two methods here were uh, extensively used in the literature introduced by Lia Tansula, I believe. And uh, this one we devised with my student uh, Tarek Hilmi. Uh, this is subtracting the background density and looking when the density drops below certain values. So we're looking at different thresholds. We examine this very detail, uh, different thresholds, different thresholds here. That's what the lines mean. This is the ellipse fitting method. <clears throat> and this is the Fourier m equal two component that shows uh, asymmetries, m equal two asymmetries and inside uh, three kiloparsecs, of course, you only have the bar. So you have this strong peak. And when this starts to drop at certain threshold, you say, okay, this is the end of the bar, we enter in the disk. This is Leo's work. Uh, so we used uh, all these to see what happens. And we found that very quickly, the bar can appear short and long. And why is that? Here is a movie with the background subtracting density. Uh, you can see that the two bar ends, this bar is frozen here. You can see fluctuations in the bar ends as the spiral connects to the bar. Uh, so we examine this in many different ways, but the bar can extend um, by factor of two sometimes to quantify this better. We made these plots here, the time evolution, and this is the bar length. The true bar length we believe is when the bar is disconnected from the spiral and given by this red line. So most of the time the bar appears to be longer. It will go from, we have here 3.7 to 5.7. So it's a huge variation on the order of 200 million years. Now the plots down here are showing Tremaine Weinberg method exactly as in the observations of Gaia Deer 2, <clears throat> observing the bar region. So measuring the, using the Tremaine Weinberg method in the bar region. And we measure a pattern speed that is fluctuating like this. If you look at galactic lat the longitude where it, which is outside the bar, you will measure the spiral structure there and you see an anti-correlation there. So whenever the bar speeds up, the spiral slows down and then they connect here. Then again, the bar, they disconnect, the bar speeds up, the spiral slows down so that they can connect as quickly as possible on the other side. And then again, and again, we had a press release on this, which was called the Cosmic Dance which described it well. So here we're showing again the bar pattern speed and here we're showing the bar uh, length fluctuations. They don't uh, necessarily uh, anti-correlate very well, although they do in uh, model one where the spiral structure is not as strong. So we suspect here there are more non-linear effects that we cannot really, uh, the regularity is not so good, but we find within this one giga year, we already find uh, two locations when the bar appears very long. So we have 5.7 here uh, and what is that about? So this is the bar length indicated here about 5.2, even though the true one is 3.2 kiloparsec, but the bar can look to be more than 5.5 kiloparsec while at the same time, it appears to be slow slow, so let's see, 40 kilometers, exactly like in the observation. So you, you can have 40, 
kilometer per second per kiloparsec pattern speed and 5.5 kiloparsec length. While the average pattern speed is about 55, right? If you average this. So if you expect that the, uh, what the local velocity field will feel is the average pattern speed, not these fluctuations, then we could explain both uh, the, the, there's an agreement now we can measure uh, from the local velocity field a, a, a fast and short bar, but in fact, right now, instantaneous is about here longer and slower. So just to summarize here, when both ends of the bar are disconnected, which they don't have to be, uh, the spiral structure is not uh, bisymmetric always. There are multiple patterns, M equal three. So there are three arm spirals, there are one arm spiral and so on. This is when they're both connected and quite a significant difference that you can see. Then we can have connected only on one side which could be the case with the Milky Way. Maybe it's one only on this side, but not on the other that we currently don't see. And connected only on the other side. <clears throat> so a fast and short bar will look like this. What is that? 3.2 giga years, we see this. At 3.8 giga years, we see that. So looking in the literature, we want to see what Experts think that uh, about the bar being connected to the spiral arms. So this is a just dust map here from uh, Red Clump and Giant Stars from Apogee Dia 14, showing the location of the inner spiral arm. And when this is overlaid on the uh, map, we, we see that there is, a, in fact, really a, an arm that's probably connected to the bar. So here are these orbits, uh, these uh, chaotic orbits, possibly that. Uh, uh, Pats is 2012 uh, described. It could be like we we described this as the pulsation, true pulsations in the bar because of the gravitational interaction of the spiral, but also because when the spiral connects just morphologically, you can see the bar being longer for a certain period of time um, from extending the bar length artificially from the spiral uh, orbits which can be, you can actually break this degeneracy by looking at the velocity field there and identifying it. <clears throat> I'm moving on to a different topic here, the disc ringing and wobbling has been quite uh, popular in the last years, also known lately as galactic as uh, seismology. So first I'll talk about this paper from 2009 that we wrote while in Strasbourg, I think this was the time when I met Panos. Uh, this was kind of a joke because we started with the wrong initial conditions, doing test particle simulations, and we saw the disk was all shaking, but it was producing very nice uh, things here in the UV plane. So this is the UV plane, but tilted, so it's the VU plane. We decided to show it this way for some reason. So we thought, uh, well, okay, so what if, uh, so no, we started with non-relaxed uh, uh, velocities, non-relaxed disks because of the velocities were uh, not uh, uh, properly assigned. And uh, we said, well, maybe this would be left from an impact of a merger on the disk. You know, so if this happens, then stars will be uh, non-uniformly distributed in an epicyclic angle. And then they'll start the phase wrapping while the disk is um, relaxing. So at the time of impact, you see everything is smooth here. There's no bar and spiral here. We just use the axisymmetric disk. And then uh, you see these arches developing. They are centered on UV00. Zero, zero. This is zero, but with the local rotation subtracted. So in fact, this is 220 to 240, the rotation of the galaxy. And these arches get closer and closer together as time goes by, two rotations, four rotations, six, 10 here. And the disk is relaxing. Finally, it gets smooth like that, or almost like that. So if you had, a, uh, if you had some data that is showing uh, such structure, you can actually stop the 
simulation at that point and say, this is how long uh, ago the impact happened. And we found such a, the point of this was to explain four high velocity streams known at the time. They're indicated by the dashed lines here. This one is 60. Was, so this is below Hercules. And we knew that the bar by itself uh, doesn't do much below uh, the Hercules stream. So this is HR 1416. Uh, this one at 80 is the Arifianto and Fuchs stream. This is Arcturus, very well studied groups. And this is the Clemens uh, uh, stream uh, was called using ray data at minus 160. So if we adjust, so we collapse here, uh, we don't have so many stars. So we want to see what things look like when you collapse the U uh, velocity and you have these, uh, these bumps. We adjusted the, uh, the separation to be about 20 kilometers per second because that's how they, they were separated, multiples of 20. So we predicted two more streams here and two more at positive velocities that uh, were not seen before. Uh, in principle, you didn't see anything at higher velocities. So this is the model at time 8.67. I guess this is a common rotation since the impact, which corresponds to 1.9. So about two years ago, there was an impact. We used the best data at the time that populates this area because Hipparchus was too uh, central. 450 stars, 80, kilopar 80 parsecs from the sun and 766 stars, 150 parsecs. And you can see that there are some things actually that may look like that, but there is no arches. So it's highly speculative. However, nine years later and a thousand times bigger samples, with Gaia Gear 2 would reveal this. This is the science verification paper by Katz et al. It's actually a Gaia collaboration et al. 2018. This was the highlighting plot from the press conference, in fact, that showed these arches performing. And then shortly after, Teresa Santoja student Ramos showed these using wavelet transform, much better separation. And here, they're not so smooth because, of course, you have the bar and spiral structure. You still have the moving groups. But away from that, you can see the separation was indeed about 20 kilometers per second. So the answer to the title of our paper was yes indeed which is interesting because somebody did a study of all papers that are pose a question typically the answer was no so here we got a yes now another thing that guy dear too could uh, shed light on was the uh, vertical disk waves that were found in sdss and rave some years ago so here first by Woodrow 2012, uh, 2012 and Williams, so this is Mary Williams with rave data in Potsdam. She did this of course before that even, <laughs> but wasn't sure. So we we're checking for a long time whether the results were right. We didn't trust the data at the time much. This is showing the vertical uh, distance from the midplane at the immediate solar neighborhood uh, below the plane minus two. So this is two kiloparsecs below the plane and above the plane. And these are the data points from which you subtract a thin disk plus a thick disk smooth model, symmetric across the midplane. And you get these oscillations. So it seems like things are not symmetric across the midplane. You can see in a different way um, and a more extended volume <clears throat> with the ray of data because it covered larger volume between six and nine and a half kiloparsecs and the sun is at eight. So in the inner disk, you saw, the, you, you can see that the vertical velocity is moving. So here is moving down, this is moving up. So the disk is expanding. This is something like a breathing wave. And the opposite is found here. Stars are moving up, these are moving down. So the disk is contracting here. And what can cause this? Here's a simulation um, with the, highest resolution at the time, 30 million particles in the disk it was a nature paper by Purcell et al. And we used this simulation with Facundo Gomez to look for ringing just before the discovery of the vertical waves. And you can see these rings. Uh, so with a more realistic simulation, we found this that ringing in, 
it is present. This is the Sagittarius stream that is currently looks like this in the Milky Way, and you can see the progenitor also on the other side of the galaxy. Uh, so as soon as this was done, we we analyzed in the vertical direction. We realized if we did it the year before when we did the ringing, if we did it in the vertical direction, we would have predicted this. But yes, this matched really well. This is the uh, fluctuations here by Widrow uh, in the background and the blue and red is the, from the simulation. So this could be explained with Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy and still the best explanation for um, for these vertical asymmetries, disk bending, wiggling, and whatever it's called, is an external perturbation, most likely from Sagittarius. Now, the spiral arms can also introduce this, but that is symmetric across the disk. So that is a breeding mode. The breeding mode will be symmetric. So these are spiral arms from the Strasbourg group. Um, so what we, we looked at uh, one of the first uh, papers here with Gaia DR2, using star force distances that are uh, uh, quite good at large distance. We go from uh, galactic center all the way to 14 kiloparsecs. So here we found what Mary found in the inner disk. There is this expansion. But in the outer disk, uh, at this region, actually, there is bending. So both above and below the disk stars are moving upwards, something like the warp is uh, we're reaching the warp. So the warp actually could be part of this whole structure. This was my student, Ismail Carrillo. And now all these things, of course, are related. This the same uh, perturber that would cause all these effects, just different ways of examining the uh, phase space. So this is one particular slice of phase space. It was a highlight of the discoveries of Gaia DR2. It was a nature paper by Teresa Antoja in 2018. This is real data, this beautiful spiral that arises. This is a distance from the disk from the disk in plane, the velocity in the same direction, Vz, and colored by the tangential velocity, the rotational velocity of stars around the galactic center. That's the coloring. And you get this beautiful spiral. What does this mean? This means that the disk is currently phase wrapping, as we had uh, suggested with the ringing. Um, so also in the vertical direction, you can see that. And this is the colored by VR. You can also kind of see it. We did um, right after with Sherwin Laporte looked at his simulations at pre-existing simulations, uh, a lot of papers written with that. It turns out they contain the spiral, but we didn't know to look. So resolution not so high, but you can still see uh, well the spiral. You can see it one better in VR. And at the time, Teresa didn't see very well in the density. And uh, Bini and Schoenig said that we should not see in the density, it should just be seen in velocity. However, this is the data. When you do, from Laporte et al, again, when you do uh, unsharp masking, you actually get the spiral to look even better than this. There's an extra wrap here that you don't see there. It should be somewhere there. So how many wraps? There are here will tell you how long this happened, similar to the ringing that I showed earlier. And this indicates that it took about 800 million years. Uh, before I showed you that, let's just to mention here that Galat data uh, was used by Blan Hotarn et al. Uh, dissecting things in the chemical space. So here are the high alpha stars that are hot. You don't see much of a spiral. The low sequence, low alpha sequence in the alpha versus iron plane you can see the spiral much better. And then for this low alpha sequence, you can split into low metallicity, high metallicity. Low metallicity shows one end in the high because they're higher uh, velocity dispersion. And these are showing this part of the spiral. So you can look, you can expand, in fact, this phase space by including chemistry. To complicate things even more, Koperskov et al, currently at the AAP, this was from before. I looked at a galaxy that had no external perturbation and found also that such a spiral can develop and associated this with Bart buckling. However, this is mostly seen inside the solar radius and we know that the spiral, uh, the ZVZ spiral extends to uh, large radii, probably 15, 16. So, it's, uh, but the two effects could be acting at the same time. 
just to show you the phase space spiral, how it winds up with time, because that was a speculation. We can test for it in the simulation by Laporte et al. here. So this is the time of the impact. Right after, there is a dipole. Thing starts to twist as time goes by, and you develop the spiral. So yes, indeed, how many turns you have in principle can tell you when this happens. People agree on 800 million years. Now, the question is why the ringing suggests two giga years an impact and uh, the vertical direction is 800 million years. We still have no answer to that question. Bridges in VRV5, so let's see how am I doing on time? Uh, we can go on for a quarter of an hour if you want. Uh-huh, okay. Let me skip this. Uh, so I want to talk about something, yeah. All right. Now, all these time-dependent phenomena that I was describing can cause radio mixing. And why is radio mixing important? What is radio mixing? Radio mixing of stars, also called radio migration, uh, is referred to stars exchanging positions in the disk. So they would uh, go around the guiding radius around which they oscillate. They go around. And then something happens. The potential changes because of something, time-dependent potential, and they're shifted to a larger radio, radius or smaller radius, and then continue to oscillate small oscillations around. So it's not the same as stars being hot and reaching from four to 10 kiloparsecs across. No, it's a star that oscillates around four that reaches 10, for example. And what is the, the effect of this is that stars that are currently in the solar neighborhood, this yellow dot, uh, illustrated here is the red, uh, the green uh, strip here. You want to see where these stars came from. This is the NBARI simulation that evolved for 10 giga years. So during these 10 giga years, uh, the solar neighborhood was populated by stars born in this huge range. However, the majority of stars come from just inside the disk, two kiloparsecs inside. And many of the simulations working with this have agreed, that's how it works. Inside out formation, stars mostly come from the inner disk. Uh, the, that becomes more interesting when you decompose this in mono-age populations. We call this mono-age populations, group of similar ages. The youngest stars will peak at the current radius because they didn't have much time to migrate. Migration requires time. And then the older the population, the further down in radius it peaks. Okay, here, 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 go orange, red. Now the, you don't... Um, yeah, the oldest ones peak around four kiloparsec, which is the end of the bar, and that causes radio migration, so it makes sense. And just an illustration, you cannot see radio migration when you see a movie because, because stars exchange places, so you don't really see it. But when you have a, this is an n-body simulation that is cut at 10 kiloparsec, and you see what happens as soon as the bar and spirals are developed, the disk starts expanding a lot. There's no... Uh, yeah, so these are just the pre-existing stars. The disk is spreading out because of strong angular momentum transport outward. And the disk is thickening at the same time. Uh, of course, to conserve angular momentum, you have some stars going out because the disk is exponential. A smaller distance of many stars traveling inwards will balance that. So people saw the disks expand. They saw the disks thicken and therefore, um, radio migration thickens the disk. We wrote a series of papers show that's not true. We got in a lot of trouble, but now pretty much everybody agrees with us. Uh, so I mean, may show you why. <clears throat> and why is knowing radio migration important? Because we can understand better chemical evolution modeling. For many years, people who do chemical evolution didn't talk to dynamicists, but dynamicists, on the other hand, didn't care about migration either much until Selwood and Beanie 2002 introduced the, the topic uh, formally for the first time in the context of chemical evolution. So what you expect from chemical evolution modeling and typical classical chemical evolution is the uh, age metallicity relation for different radii 
you will see that, that there's a quickly evolving. So the metallicity is uh, uh, going up very quickly and then it's flattening, but still going on until the present day. And that curve is different for different radii. Yeah, because we know that we have a negative metallicity gradient and that is related to the disk forming inside out. So if there is no migration, all the data will lie all around eight kiloparsec given the error. However, given this that I showed earlier, that stars come from all over the disk, you would expect that you get this. So there's a huge spread. Uh, many of the stars are coming from here. So there is this. Uh, so in order to understand better chemical evolution, you need to know uh, how much radio migration happened. And radio migration is a function of radius and of time. How we quantify that is by uh, looking at a certain time period, say half a giga year, and plotting the galactic radius versus the change in galactic radius for all stars. Um, that's like the change in angular momentum. So, for example, this is the bar correlation. Across the bar correlation, there is a strong uh, exchange of angular momentum. Stars just inside will shift by two kiloparsec out. Stars just outside will shift in. Now, these stars will be picked up by the spiral arms and will keep going like this, jumping from one spiral arm to another. So that's how we can do. And now I will move to how can we actually estimate stellar birth positions for uh, this has been the goal for many years. And we came up here a couple of years ago with something very simple, but uh, it seems quite effective. All right, so we have a sample here of high resolution sample, the HARP sample that probably many of you have uh, heard. And you can estimate very good isochron ages for turn off and subgiant stars. We have only 603 stars. They are all at the same radius, 40 parsecs from the sun. So it's, everything is at 8 kiloparsecs. And they have a range of metallicity, as you can see, and the coloring is the age. Now, we know the ISM, or the gas metallicity from which stars are currently forming, or stars are... Sorry. Really sorry, um, home office. All right, so um, we have all the stars uh, arranged like this. And if we knew the gas metallicity gradient as a function of time and radius, which of course we don't, there's no way that we know that directly because we only see the final one. We see what it is today. But let's say that we knew. What we can do is distribute stars depending on their age on the gradient, the ISM gradient from which they were formed. And that will tell you where they were, where they come from. It's very good. But we try to, we don't know what it is, right? But we can try to guess. So the way we go about it is, uh, what about, what if we had flatter gradient? So this seems to work fine. What if it was a bit flatter? We redistribute the stars and we got a bunch of them with negative birth radii, which we don't want. Imaginary radii, no. So let's try different possibilities. Uh, this will be done best with MCMC modeling. But for now, we can just uh, see how it makes sense that you uh, will get to the right answer. For example, here, Anders et al. showed the for mono-age populations what the gradient is. And this is the value metallicity at the solar radius. And this is showing the slopes that he measured. So, some people believe there's no radio migration. Stars were born where they are now. And in that case, this will be valid. If this happened, then stars would have come from all over the disk. Uh, a lot of stars coming from the outer disk. 
And that's not what we expect from end body simulations in principle and from inside out formation. So let's now try linear evolution of the metallicity of the solar radius, this variation here. Linear evolution and a constant slope of minus 0.1. Then we get that stars. Uh, the oldest stars come the most from the outer disk, and we want the opposite. Now, let's do a steep linear evolution, then we get the imaginary birth radii. So what is the combination of these two? Uh, we have uh, a fast one and then a slow one. That is what this is showing, a fast one and then slow one. And let's keep the slopes the same. Starting to look good, the peaks, this is what we want to look like, the peaks to shift gradually to the inner disk, and the peaks are shifting gradually to the inner disk. So this here, this function controls the peak position. But now we want less spreading out. We want stars to be born in the disk. So we play now with the, with the slope, except for the present day ISM. We cannot control that. But we can start here with flat or with steep. And it seems like if you start with steep and gradually flatten, you get a very good match here as a zoom in. Very good match here. The absolute height here doesn't matter because this, of course, is uh, there's a many selection effects here that in this case actually don't matter so much. The shape is important. Uh, the, the peaks are important and the spread is important. And they're very, very similar, which is amazing because this, we arrived at this by having a, a fully blown disk growing cosmological simulation assigning chemical evolution model and all that. And with this one, we don't do anything of the sort. We just do this distribution of the stars. There's no guarantee that actually we can achieve such functions that they will not be double peaked, for example. I mean, all these are peaked like this in here. So we're very happy with this. And before I tell you what you can do with this, once you have the birth radius, you can combine with kinematics and you can learn a great deal about the formation of the Milky Way. Before that, I will uh, tell you about Simpson's paradox. So this is a thing known since 1902, first described as you by you 1902, and then made more popular with Simpson 1951, related to medical statistics originally, but then known in many physics fields. So I, I wrote a paper here, Simpson's paradox in galactic archaeology, because it turns out a lot of phenomena can be explained with this. And this is mostly in fact, it's not a paradox, but that's what is known as. So they, this the, to show the pictures described as the best is imagine you have a certain um, set of data the total population has a positive gradient but the subsets of data have a so this is that's a paradox because that's why they call it a paradox because all the subsets that make the total population go one way when you combine them they go the other way how is this possible let's say these are young stars let's say these are old stars Let's say this metallicity and this is radius. This is something we see in the galaxy. Now, the reason why you would get this has, has to do with the density in this case for mono age populations. So you know that old stars are centrally concentrated, so very heavy in the center, but quickly drop out. Young stars are more uniformly distributed. When you do different combinations, for example, closer to the disk mid plane you will still retain uh, the, uh, this negative gradient, even though flatter. When you go higher above the plane, you'll get a balance because these are starting to dominate here and pulling this end down. But here, they don't have much of an effect, right? So this is flat. And when you go high above the plane, you have an inversion. This has been seen in all the major uh, galactic surveys. Um, so, yeah, this was, we provided an explanation already, already in 2014 uh, to explain the rave data. Uh, this is an example that we put in the in our uh, Simpsons Paradox paper. This is from the simulation. Magnesium over iron also happens uh, close to the plane, very close to the plane, far away the plane. And this bar here doesn't indicate error or anything like that, but the how much mass there is there. Okay, so there's a lot of mass in the old ones. But very quickly that decays. And here's the same above the plane. 
but we don't have any young stars. So when you have the total on the left, you have still positive close to the plane and above the plane uh, well inverted. So we call this a strong case of Simpson's paradox. And uh, moving to another one, birth radius versus velocity dispersion. This is, has to do with whether radio migration thickens the disk or not. Uh, we did this in order to explain a ray relation, new relation in RAVE that we discovered uh, that high alpha stars actually uh, will, the highest alpha stars are kinematically cool. And to understand why, and we, we looked at in the simulation, stars when stars come from, um, so all the stars are currently in this final radius, but we want to see where the hottest stars come from as a function of birth radius. So this is the birth radius of the stars that are currently here, okay? This is the velocity dispersion. It appears from this plot that the stars that are currently the hottest ones in the solar neighborhood came from the very inner disk. So this is radio migration heats. See the stars that came from the inner disk made the disk very hot. However, if you break this into mono age populations, and you start with the oldest ones. The oldest ones, the hottest ones of the old set were born locally. The ones that came from the inner disk are half the velocity dispersion. That makes sense because stars migrate the best when they're on cool orbits. They, they, when they're on hot orbits, they don't feel the perturbus, the barons in the spiral. So when stars get younger, you still get the same effect here. Stars coming from the inner disk are cooler than the ones born here. So the locally born stars are the hottest. That's what makes the, the thick disk. Still happening at three, four giga years. So finally, at uh, two giga years and younger, stars coming from the inner disk are a little bit hotter. Stars coming from the outer disk a bit cooler. But the, of course, the overall effect is dominated by this. So no, radio migration does not heat. At the time, we never thought that we'll be able to test this observationally. This was just a theoretical plot to show. But now that we have radio uh, birth radii, I can make this plot from the HARPS data. And look at that. All the data here. Um, the total is uh, negative, has a negative slope. And the oldest ones have a very strong positive slope that decreases and eventually it inverts. So this was really. Amazing, we're very happy here because this thing is mostly model independent. You just want to have uh, correct distributions of unexpected distributions of birth radii. This was another strong case of uh, Simpson's paradox. So I'll show one more here, the age metallicity relation, uh, very well known, very important for chemical evolution models. And these are some of the most uh, um, cited plots here. Casagrande et al. sample. Uh, this is the guy, ISO data, high resolution. If what you see here is the last 10 giga years, there was no chemical enrichment in the, low, in the solar neighborhood, which does not make sense. Why would there be no chemical enrichment? You know that stars are ejecting their metals in the um, ISM, and then you have to get more and more metal rich. This is Harv's data, also quite flat. But now that we have birth radii, we can actually do this for birth radii. And we see quite well-defined slopes for different radii because of migration. Stars that come here from different places will have well-defined age metallicity relations, which then, because of Simpson's paradox or this effect, statistical effect, it will flatten and will look like there is nothing, but it there is. This is a weak case because there's no inversion, it's just losing the relation. So going toward the end of my talk, finally I'll talk about thick disks. Of course, thick disks are um, the product of uh, heating the disk and making how the disk is, uh, making the disk hot vertically. And this can be done by external perturbations the best, but the problem with external perturbations is that they always flare the disk and typically, uh, you don't see flaring in external galaxies. So there was a you know, kind of a paradox because uh, you always flare, you want those are the best 
makers of thick disks, but yet you have this flaring. And that's why people like so much radio migration as well when first uh, postulated that thick disks can be created by uh, radio migration because then it will keep the stars, uh, the disk also constant. So this is one of the first thick disks discovered, Tsikuri 1980. It looks like this. Deeper observations will reveal that. So it's extended as the thin disk, okay? Uh, yeah, this is the on the same. Extension. Just a couple of minutes more. <laughs> yes, I have two more slides. I have two, okay. three more slides. Right. So we looked at this, and again, inside out forming galaxy formation, decomposing by the, by by uh, age, and what you see, star of similar ages, they flare very strongly. So this is the um, fitting here. Uh, fitting lines to each radius and finding the, uh, the scale height of the disk. So this is this thickness is actually the scale height. So the scale height is extremely uh, fastly increasing here in the inner you know, disk from old stars, and that's decreasing for younger and younger. And finally, for the youngest stars, there's hardly any uh, flaring. This comes from external perturbations mostly, but there are other sources as well. The interesting thing is that when you put everything together, you decompose the total population into a thin and thick disk, that is gone. And uh, so in order to see this effect, it has to be an inside growing disk. So it cannot be pre-assembled disk that we just run. That predicted the, uh, as you go across here in the thick disk, that tells you the, this uh, thick disk will drop in age quickly. So we predicted that. And that was indeed, uh, so these stars are born hard of K. This is a strong case. Uh, sorry, no, it's a weak case of Simpson's paradox again. So we predicted this uh, strong decrease in the thick disk. And indeed, we found for these slices and apogee data with Marie Martig, we found very strong decrease in both alpha. And this is in alpha and this is in age. So this uh, explains actually why in external galaxies we don't see this. And for the press release, we did this for NGC 891, an illustration would be uh, that, yeah, with the born hot stars here, they're flaring, but they don't reach far away. When you put everything together, it just flattens. This was um, looked at, so when you look at mono abundance populations, you don't see any flaring because again, Simpson's paradox works there. But when you look at mono age, uh, that this was done by uh, Macri et al, Napogee data we actually could see here flaring in the oldest populations. So finally, I just want to say a couple of words about Formos project, which is a follow-up of Gaia. Uh, just to show you, this is now outdated, but the current coverage of, this was the rave, the last data release. Apogee now, Apogee has uh, covered this side as well with Apogee South. And uh, foremost, which will start in a couple of years, and uh, one I'm one of the PIs for the disk low resolution survey, will cover this part of the disk. Uh, we can see the actual target catalogs. This is how much it covers. These are actual Gaia DR2 and now EDR3 stars that will uh, cover this part of the disk. There are four major surveys here and 10 minor. <laughs> this is the Boge Extended Solar Neighborhood Dynamical Disk and Chemical Disk. And we'll have 10 to 15 million stars with very good radio velocities of the array stars that will reach very high distances. So we're currently submitting the catalogs actually today, it finally worked uh, to ESO. We had a deadline and we hope that this will go through. All right, so we'll get to my conclusions. I hope I conveyed to you galactic disks are frisky, they bend, they wiggle, they wobble, ring, and mix. Time dependent phenomena are very important to consider. The Milky Way is definitely not in equilibrium. People were doubting this before. And they knew it was an ax not axiometric, even though people still use the axiometric models. But now it's not just non axiometric, it's also constantly evolving uh, with time. So just matching certain snap is not enough. You have to uh, have a time evolving potential. 
So interaction with other galaxies, you get ringing, bending, and warping. Resonances with spiral um, bar with spirals and bar um, gives you resonant moving groups. And radio migration comes from all these time variant phenomena. We need detailed modeling to interpret the observations, as I just said. Age information crucial. So you probably saw that everywhere used age. Without age, you have huge degeneracies, and age has been the uh, hardest thing to get for stars, but now things are picking up quickly, especially with astroseismology. So Plato and TESS, TESS is already happening and we're getting data already. And of course, K2 and Kepler and Coho earlier uh, have provided very important sets. Simpson's paradox must exist in your field. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Just be careful, you have to find this lurking variable, it's called something that will break, that will break uh, uh, the, the degeneracy to get the, to break this paradox, let's say. So my conclusion again will be that Gaia plus spectroscopic follow-up surveys such as Weave and Foremost and others will definitely revolutionize uh, further our understanding of the Milky Way. Thank you very much. I will leave this on for now. Okay, now you hear me. Yeah. So many thanks for the very, very interesting talk and all this information that you shared with us. Uh, well, okay, uh, we have uh, not so much time, but a few questions uh, if somebody wants to ask. We traditionally look to the audience first if someone has to ask something. Then I, I, I do have one question before we see if there is another question from people around. Uh, about the, the two bars of the Milky Way, I want to ask you something about. Uh, could be that uh, the extent of the long bar is up to the Lagrangian, the unstable Lagrangian points of the short one? So what are, what are the short and long bar? I thought that they, I mean, the one is the peanut, the one that is thicker and the one that is thinner, you mean? Yeah, but no, 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 long and short. I mean, the one that rotates. Oh, you mean the, ah, not at the same time. You're saying, one, da, da, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think exactly that's, that's what it is. I think that your paper I found uh, very interesting in this respect that it could be that you're saying in the ANSI, you can see that there are chaotic orbits, but those ANSI, before they develop actually and turn at 90 degrees with the bar, for a bit they stay along, uh, they elongate the bar, depending on the rotation. So if you have a very uh, time, a small time output, you, you can actually find times when it's, um, when the spiral arm really extends the, uh, the bar. And I think, that could be the region. It's just that it's a function, strong function of time. Yeah. That's that's what it. That's what where those orbits are, right? Yeah. yeah well, uh, what I mean is that in many external galaxies, we see something that we describe sometimes as the envelope of the bar. So it is the bar, and then there is a weaker, or not a weaker, a less dense uh, feature that surrounds the bar. And usually this is uh, composed by uh, chaotic orbits that are stay along the bar. So that this is what uh, creates the envelope. But uh, sooner or later, they found they wait uh, to outside the corrotation of the bar uh, through the Lagrangian points. So I'm wondering if this extent is uh, material that it is around the, the main bar that diffuses slowly and makes this uh, chaotic spiral stuff or whatever. But in any case, it goes through the Lagrangian points of the uh, shorter one and just uh, uh, goes uh, in a larger radii. So I'm wondering, well, a, a check would be to see if the Lagrangian point of the uh, faster inner bar is about where the end of the uh, second uh, longer bar is. Just an idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess. But the Lagrange point is not the right. It's uh, 
perpendicular the, the minor axis of the bar. No, no, they, they are long close to the both of the axes. Well, they are not aligned, but they are the same direction, let's say. Yeah. The major axis of both these components. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, yeah, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. We haven't looked into detail. Yeah, well, we're just looking at the effects that are happening, you know, in the end-body simulations. And we haven't investigated in there deeply, like what type of orbits make this, but it's mm. necessary. That's an option. So is there any other question that uh, somebody wants to ask? I don't hear or see anything. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, then thank you, uh, Ivan, again. Uh, Welcome. We're running out short, short, short of, uh, of time because we have, uh, we book some time for our Zoom link in any case. So for those that uh, of you that you want to see again the, the talk, to, to follow again the talk, it will be on our webpage in a few days. Uh, thank you very much again and uh, hope that uh, well, in better times where we can meet again uh, from close. Yeah, <laughs> Looking forward to those. <laughs> is, is someone speaking? Is there a question? Yeah, I don't know if I, I can be heard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, yes, yes, yes. Please okay. go on. <clears throat> uh, sorry, I, I, it took some time before I understood that I sh where I should unmute it. Okay, okay. But yes, uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I think it is more or less clear that that galaxies are not in a perfect equilibrium. Now, uh, on the other hand, one sees many spiral galaxies with very beautiful spiral arms. Uh, the, uh, the, the instability or the variation, time-dependent variation, must also affect external galaxies. Yes. And therefore, at what level do you think the spiral pattern in the galaxy, in our galaxy, is affected? Is it just very unregular? And is the uh, artist impression very wrong? Uh, or is it not so important effects? Yeah, very good question. Very complex answer <laughs> that I cannot probably give. But what I uh, can think about this is that um, what you see in the galaxies, what you see in external galaxies, the, is just what you see at, the, at this moment. If you look at simulations, you can always see a movie in simulations that the spirals are changing the morphology constantly. That's why people were also confused for many years that spirals are transient. And they're not necessarily transient on a rotational time scale. They are transient on a one giga year scale or something. But you have multiple modes. Those multiple modes move at different pattern speeds. So they, at certain times, they overlap and produce a beautiful grand design picture, which is actually composed of three sets of spiral arms, one that comes out the bar, one that goes something like solar neighborhood, solar radius, and now outside. So at certain times, they will all align and will make it look beautiful. If you looked at this galaxy in half a giga year, it will look with broken arms like this. Do you know those like where the arms get these almost right angles when they're disconnected, in fact? And then they connect on the other side. So uh, all these effects are happening, of course, in all external galaxies. And uh, this is not to say that you have these nonlinear effects. It's not to say that the galaxy will look like the dog chews on it, right? It's, uh, they can still look, you know, like you can still spiral structure nicely. Um, but the orbits that compose that and that the orbits that are in the disk overall uh, may be on irregular orbits or constantly changing with time. So we have actually a paper in preparation where we can match six galaxies with different number of spiral arms, a different uh, shape of the spiral arms with the same simulation, <laughs> but a different time snap, uh, time, time snap shots. Okay, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, now I think that to the end. Thank you, Ivan, again. Uh, Thank you again. Uh, the rest of you will be informed about our next uh, Tuesday's seminar. Bye-bye. Yeah, send me also an email, yeah.
Sure. 